Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. The rain train is pulling into southeast Michigan. Find out how long we can expect to stay wet. Anger turns to action. No justice! No peace! Students and faculty stage protest at Eastern Michigan University as racist graffiti continues to appear on campus. Traffic light taken out, a tire tread on the front lawn, and crumbled metal in the middle of the driveway. But wait till you see what this 91-year-old's house looks like around the corner. Maybe you can help the story on Local 4. All coming up, but we're going to start Local 4 News at 5 with brand new revelations in the Chelsea Brook murder case. The man charged with killing her told police he actually tried to save her life. Good to have you with us today. That was just one of a number of new claims that came out today inside a Monroe courtroom. That's right. Let's get right to our Priya Man, she's live in Monroe tonight. Priya, there's a lot to go through. And Carmen, a Monroe County detective, says Daniel Clay told him that he tried to perform CPR on Chelsea Brook after they engaged in consensual rough sex and that he panicked once he realized the woman had died, even saying that he cried for about 20 minutes, to which the prosecution noted he never took the young woman to the hospital or even called 911. For the first time, we heard what Daniel Clay told police when questioned about the murder of Chelsea Brock. The lead detective in the case says Clay admit to choking the woman and then disposed of the body. It stated that um, she had asked him to choke her during the act and that he had he put his hand or hands on her neck for approximately 20 to 30 seconds. Um, and at that point, he, he began to move positions a little bit and noticed that she was not moving. He claimed that he had attempted CPR on her. Um, <laughs> However, he said that he'd freaked out. He didn't call the police because he was kind of scared and freaking out, so he began to drive around. The defense argues Brunk was fatally injured during consensual sex with Clay. During cross-examination, Brunk's friend was pressed about the victim's sexual preferences. Did you indicate that uh, Ms. Brunk was very promiscuous to Detective Smith? Yes. Did she like uh, rough sex? Sort of uh, violent or aggressive uh, sex? No. Friends testified Brooke was intoxicated the night she disappeared. The woman was last seen in the parking area of a Halloween party in Frenchtown Township in 2014. The mother of Clay's child was at the same party and is now a witness for the prosecution. Um, she actually made an awesome costume, uh, homemade out of like leaves. Um, and she had her purple wig and her jug. She says Clay never mentioned Brooke until he was arrested. That he's extremely sorry. Um, please tell his son that I... Please tell Bryson I love him. I'm really sorry. Yeah, he said he was going to be gone for a really long time. And the medical examiner testified Bruck had numerous fractures to her face, neck, and jaw, consistent with someone who'd been in a car crash. Now, Clay has been bound over for trial on two counts of open murder and concealing the death of an individual, and he's back in court on Friday for a separate CSC investigation. Reporting live from Monroe, I'm Priya Mann, Local 4. Now, Priya, I understand the defense questioned detectives about whether Clay specifically asked for an attorney during questioning. And the detective said that Clay mentioned an attorney twice, but never specifically said he wanted a lawyer present. Of course, that interrogation was recorded. We expect to see a portion of that during the trial. All right, we'll look forward to it. Our Priya Mann reporting for us live. Devin. All right, Carmen, we're here with Ben now, watching a little bit of rain that's come through and now more on the way, but still strangely mild for yeah. November. We're continuing our little late summer feel yeah. here because we had thunderstorms out there in spots today. In addition to some of that milder air, uh, lightning strikes just now fading off of Fort Live radar. But as this round of rain moves out, we've got more to go coming in from the west. Uh, even though this little batch is starting to weaken a little bit coming in off of Lake Michigan, you can see out west of Chicago that there are already cells popping there and more lightning strikes showing up around the Windy City. So we've got more chances of rain, especially after midnight tonight. That's when the bulk of the rain comes through. We'll look at that, how much rain to expect and where the temperatures will go from here. And here's a hint. They're not going up. More on that coming up, guys. All right, Ben. Well, we've just learned Macomb Community College is closing its center campus in Clinton Township for the rest of the night because of a security incident in a bathroom. Now, police say there is no immediate threat and are only closing the center campus as a precaution. Well, let's stay with campus news. Anger over a number of instances of racist graffiti on campus at Eastern Michigan University turned into action early today. No 
That was the scene early this morning on campus, and another one was held right around midday. Our Rod Maloney shows us how both students and faculty are fed up. A lot of students decided not to go to class today here at Eastern Michigan University and came out here today instead to be part of a much larger protest than the one that happened last night. Defiantly declaring this is our house, EMU student body sent a firm message to the person or persons scrawling racist graffiti on campus. This most recent incident, the other night on the Ford building here, EMU faculty backed this rally, though few officials spoke. Jaron Johnson is the Black Student Union president. I don't know if it'll stop them, but it'll at least promote the message that this is intolerate our institution. And if you continue to put these messages on the wall, students will speak out against it because it's wrong. EMU alum and husband of a current student, Hunter Lockwood, said everyone needs to unite against hate. It's uh, absolutely incredible and unacceptable. So um, had to show up and voice my uh, concern about this and at least be part of the solution. The university itself took some criticism for not doing enough here. Junior Abby Davis of Jackson wasn't especially happy. Came here to see what the faculty and the staff are, have to say about what they're going to do to help students, specifically black students, be successful and feel included and welcome. Still, EMU's president upped the reward for the arrests of the racist graffiti artist or artists from five to $10,000 and formed a commission on diversity and inclusion, including administration, staff and students to study race issues as soon as this latest incident came to light. Many of the students here expressed concern that this can't be the end of these kinds of discussions. And in fact, the university is well aware of that. And the faculty is now going to be holding an old fashioned 60s style teach in to try and keep that conversation going. It's going to happen throughout the university on November 14th. In Ypsilanti, Rod Maloney, Local 4. All right, Rod. Well, campus police are looking through security video to see if they can find the culprit. If you know anything about this incident, please call Eastern Michigan Police. Now to a developing story out of Iowa. Right now, Des Moines police are trying to put the pieces together after two of their own were ambushed and killed in two separate attacks overnight. In fact, the man who police say pulled the trigger, Scott Michael Green, is in custody after more than nine hours on the run. Urbandale officer Justin Martin and Des Moines Sergeant Tony Bemenio were both sitting in their squad cars when investigators say Green walked up and started shooting, firing more than a dozen rounds. There definitely wasn't an opportunity for these officers to defend themselves or respond to the attack. Now, investigators say they don't have any evidence that clearly points to a motive in the murders, but law enforcement sources tell NBC News that Green has, quote, a history of problems and mental issues. Quite a mess on Detroit's west side after a car slammed into this Detroit home. Police are still investigating, but they do believe speed definitely played a role. As our Lauren Podell shows us, the folks living inside were already struggling before this happened. Yeah, my name is Herbert Washington. When it comes to cleaning up his yard, Herb Washington doesn't know where to start. Had somebody run into my house this morning. And there's no question as to why. See that door? Yep. My room is right next to it. A shattered traffic light on the ground, sunken tire treads in the yard, and crumbling brick, not to mention the gaping hole in the garage. This is what's left of the house Herb grew up in at the corner of Dexter and Oakman after a Dodge Ram pickup smashed into the side of it just after five this morning. I thought at first it was a dream. And then you, you wake up to hear voices and then you know something's wrong because you smell gasoline. And it wasn't just Herb inside sleeping at the time, but also his 91 year old bipolar mother who he takes care of. My mom's been here since 1962. My main concern is keeping her um, calm. calm. Detroit police are still investigating what caused the crash, but the ram was split into several pieces. The 22 year old driver and a passenger taken to Henry Ford Hospital. Everyone is expected to be OK, but what happens next is what has her worried. I'm concerned with getting this boarded up. There won't be any people trying to walk through here and he's trying to do whatever he can. So we need some board up service to restore the home he and his mother cherish. This means quite a bit, you know, it means as much as the house could mean to a person. 
Right off the bat, Detroit police do not believe that alcohol was a factor, but when you check out that damage and you look at the speed limit in this area, Detroit police do not believe a 30 mile per hour car caused all of that damage. So speed is certainly a factor that they'll be investigating. Reporting from Detroit's West Side, Lauren Podell, Local 4. All right, Lauren, and if you'd like to help Herb and his 91 year old mother, we have posted the contact information at our website. Click on Detroit.com. Now to decision 2016, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton are keeping their focus both on Michigan. And this is we are now less than six days away from the election in Detroit. Donald Trump Jr. rallying votes for his dad. He also made stops at Michigan State and Grand Valley. And Donald Trump's daughter Ivanka Trump set to make a stop at the Marriott on in uh, Troy on Big Beaver. You're looking at live pictures rent right now as folks are awaiting the start of that event. It is supposed to get underway at about 630. She's going to participate in a roundtable discussion that is going to center on women in business. She'll also be answering questions during a community forum. And we've just learned she is going to be holding another event tomorrow in Rochester. So the Trump focus stays here and does for the Clintons as well. well. Let's take a look at the Democratic side. In fact, Senator Bernie Sanders was in Kalamazoo talking to young voters at Western Michigan University. Sanders is now at a rally in Traverse City. The Vermont senator won the Democratic primary here in Michigan. So it is crucial for the Clinton campaign to win the votes of his supporters. A big military mistake here in Michigan causes a huge scare. New tonight, what caused several small bombs to fall from the sky. And the two parents charged with murdering their three-year-old little boy appear in court at five. The startling new revelations coming to light over who they're blaming for his death. Guy? He's been threatened with a gun, been beat up, had dogs sicked on him. He's not a cop. He is an attendance officer for the city of Detroit, trying to get kids into school. There's a new effort to make sure parents comply. We'll ride along as he enforces. Tonight, new at six. I back alley. You don't have to touch the camera, ma'am. Camera. We they weren't happy to see our cameras at a local clinic where drug test samples were found dumped outside with personal information on them. New at six is that kind of carelessness actually illegal. Also, if this woman looks familiar, police want to hear from you right away. At six, how she allegedly tricked a local senior citizen into handing over $20,000. You can't raise test scores or educate students if they aren't in school. And that's why Detroit's interim superintendent has made attendance enforcement a much higher priority. Parent leaders, teachers and principals are trying to drive that message home at school. But as our guy Gordon shows us, for chronically absent students, tougher enforcement and intervention is the only solution. Here's what we know. Research shows chronic absenteeism, and that's defined as averaging two absences per month, can have a devastating impact on a child's future because it raises the probability of dropping out to 40 to 60 percent. And that's why if your child has three unexplained absences, the attendance officer will come knocking. People put their dogs on me. I've had guns pulled on me. I've had knives pulled on me. He's not serving warrants, looking for drugs, or tracking fugitives. He's just trying to get kids back into class. I'm caught. I'm here because I have a, um, an attendance problem. Parents in this home said they kept their child out because they're expecting to move. But if it continues to be worse, then I'll be forced to do a case. At another, this little fifth grader has missed eight days. Mom says the girl's father, the non-custodial parent, has kidnapped her. So it's Mr. Peterson from the school. Kirk She's Peterson's talking. one of nearly 50 agents covering 97 schools in Detroit. They will seek out 60 chronically truant students on any given week. Parental indifference is the biggest enemy. It's, it's sad, but there's really nothing I can do about it. At the end of the day, all they care about is, you know, I want to get my child in school because I got other things to do. And, and that, that's, what, that's what really bothers me. Parents face a juvenile court summons, potential loss of welfare benefits, or a fine. Problem solving, not punishment, is the ultimate goal and will fix 40% of these cases. Were you technically homeless? Yeah, for a minute. Kimberly Davis and her seven kids had huge obstacles. Thanks to Kirk, she got emergency housing, and everybody's back in school. He got the kids what they needed. 
for his school supplies and he getting them clothes. He just keep in touch with them. And she kids, says her kids love school. It has been a game changer for that family. Uh, but as you saw, there's a variety of reasons why this doesn't happen. In talking to Kirk Peterson and of the district, they say, look, we could use more enforcement officers. And if this millage passes next week, they may be able to do that. Also, they need laws with more teeth because right now punishment is not certain. And that gives some parents who are indifferent a very cavalier attitude. Again, this is not all parents. But in some cases, we heard from teachers that said, you know, when it comes to getting homework done, things like that, they do think it's much higher than 50 or 60 percent. We're live. I'm Guy Gordon, Local 4. That really gives you an idea, Carmen and Devin, of, of what they are up against. Yes, but they have to start somewhere. And certainly yep. knocking on the door and writing out citations is just the beginning. But you get the sense, tunnel layers to the problem. Very yes, complex. Yes. All right, let's bring in uh, Ben now, who told us that uh, uh, we already saw a little bit of rain earlier today, and now you've bring in a little more. Bring in more, yeah. yeah. And that uh, picture behind Guy reminds me that we're probably going to see some wet leaves uh, no. all, all over the place uh, by the tomorrow morning. Uh, not only are we expecting a good chunk of rain, but there's still going to be some embedded thunderstorms in what we're going to be watching here over the next 12 hours or so. On the temperature map, uh, we talked about how mild it was already this uh, earlier this newscast, and you can see where the front has kind of stalled out. It is still in the 70s down in Lenaway in Monroe County. Adrian 73, Monroe 71. The rest of his 50s and 60s where that cold front has come through. It will sort of buck back just a little bit, but it's the wave that rides along that front that's going to trigger the rain later on tonight. Look at the difference between yesterday and today. Of course, we had that huge 25 degree warm up yesterday. Now we're about 15 to 20 degrees back down on the other side. So the roller coaster continues, but we do have more rain to go. Even though that next round sort of fizzled out here coming in off of Lake Michigan. As you work your way behind that, there's plenty more here in central Illinois. This is what we're expecting as we get past midnight tonight. So once the rain starts up again in earnest, it's likely going to continue for most of the overnight and then again, probably wrapping up by early tomorrow morning. So that's the wave that's bringing it in. Once that low exits, this is 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. Most of that stuff will be out of here, save just for a few east side showers. There is going to be a little trough of low pressure come through tomorrow evening. That may trigger some light showers, won't last very long. And then the cool air and the dry air sets in. In fact, we've got a mostly dry forecast beyond that that'll take us into a good chunk of next week. So your four zone forecast is dealing with rainfall totals tonight and around the metro zone. We're going to be seeing probably about a quarter to maybe a half inch in general. The further north you get, this is where those numbers are going to start to ramp up in northern Oakland County south zone. You're going to be last to see these showers. Most of this is going to fall as we get overnight towards tomorrow morning. Tenth to two tenths of an inch higher totals though in the west zone, especially up here in Genesee County could be uh, topping an inch in spots and the big winner for rainfall is going to be our north zone. That's where we're expecting most of the rain nine tenths over an inch in spots. So it's uh, going to be a soaker. You've already picked up more than a quarter to a third of an inch there already. And there will be some scattered thunder again in these storms tonight. Everything wrapped up very early tomorrow. Then we see a couple of those very light scattered sprinkles in the afternoon. But temperatures staying pretty close to average as we head into the weekend. Of course, we're setting the clocks back this weekend. We've got Election Day on Tuesday, which does look dry. So for turnout reasons, uh, that looks like it's uh, going to be OK. Although there's a slight chance we could see a, sp a sprinkle there. We'll have to keep our eyes on it as we get into next week. All right. Thank it, you, it doesn't extend into next Friday, which I'm predicting is going to be mostly Carmen that day. Ah, you think that'll make it on the map? <laughs> that'll be the day oh my when gosh. my partner here uh, retires. And as we've been uh, for these past couple of days and into next week, we've got a number of people wanting to send their well wishes. Really? Watch. Oh. Carmen, I can't believe that you're using the word retirement, though it's not an appropriate word because you'll never retire. You are such a part of this community. You've done so much and you're going to keep doing so much. But I've known you a very long time. We've seen a lot of historical moments in the history of this state, the region, and the city, and the country. You've been a good and wonderful friend, not only to me, to John, but to so many. And I wish for you whatever you want the future to be, but we sure are going to miss you on that nightly news, knowing that there was someone there with a strong, credible voice that was always full of integrity. 
Debbie. She's going to make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I've heard that from so a number of people who really aren't thoughtful. sure that retirement's quite the right word. Yeah, you know? I, I don't know if it is either. I mean, there are other things. Come yeah, on, there are yeah. other things, and we won't talk about that not right yet, now. Not yet. Not yet. Because Dr. McGeorge is here. Let's check in with Please. Frank. Tough fact to follow. Local doctors are seeing more cases of shingles. I'm Dr. Frank McGeorge. Coming up, the clear up over the confusion of what causes the painful rash and how the virus can spread. All right, Doc, with first bombs falling from the sky in northern Michigan. It is not the start of a joke. This is the proof. We'll explain next. Get every Rather alarming story from up north in Grayling Township. Imagine you're out hunting while walking through a field. You see a bomb fall from the sky. It actually happened. This is the proof of exactly what happened. A fighter jet was conducting a training exercise over the National Guard's Camp Grayling base. Six bombs and one missile fell from the plane by mistake. The six bombs only weigh about 20 pounds each. The missile, though, weighs a few hundred pounds. It measures seven feet long. All of them landed on the ground. The National Guard says this is a rare mishap. Problems with commercial airlines would be much more frequent uh, than you would see with, with a situation like this where, where all of those training ordinance uh, came from off of that A-10. Right. So it's pretty darn rare. And we should point out the bombs did not explode. Uh, no one was injured. But well, in training, I mean, do you use real ammunition? I don't think you're supposed to. Are you? Exactly right. Uh, over in West Michigan, there will be no charges in the mauling death of a four-year-old girl. Well, investigators said that little Kiana McNeil was training her family's new dog with a treat when it suddenly attacked her. Now, this happened north of Sturgis back on October 23rd. Well, today, prosecutors announced no charges will be filed against anyone, including the dog's previous owner. They cited zero evidence the dog had aggressive tendencies. New at 530. An important warning concerning a popular home remedy. When you buy these essential oils, you don't actually know what you're getting. We'll show you the one way essential oils could end up doing more harm than good. In the race for the White House, the story is turnout, more specifically the turnout or disappointing turnout of African-American voters. A three-year-old in Inkster beaten to death today, his father and the father's girlfriend back in court. What really happened to three-year-old Timmy Smith? We've got new details coming up next on Local 4. It's dinner time. Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5.30 starts now. A father and his girlfriend charged in the beating death of a toddler, and now both are blaming each other for the boy's death. Topping our news at 5.30, the three-year-old Inkster boy was taken to Garden City Hospital earlier this month with severe injuries, and he later died. The Wayne County Medical Examiner has ruled his death a homicide. The autopsy found that little Timmy Smith was beaten so badly that his liver was split in two. Sean Lay joins us live with the inside story of what happened to this poor little boy, Sean. And what we're trying to do is piece together exactly what happened to this little boy. And what we're hearing this evening is that Smith's father allegedly came home in an emergency and in a rage and allegedly attacked his much younger girlfriend and then allegedly attacked his son. Aurelio Smith and his girlfriend Andrea Brincy back in court charged with felony murder, first degree child abuse and torture of Smith's little boy, three year old Timmy Smith. A and packed courtroom, two families uh, divided. Statement. Mr. Callahan, is it correct that you've not been able to download the your client's statement? Today we learned that both Smith and Bracey gave extensive statements to Inkster police okay. following their arrest for Timmy's death. Defense attorneys say they've been unable to view DVDs of those statements due to a technical issue. But Local 4 has learned more about what happened to the little boy inside his father's apartment. Sources telling us Aurelio Smith was out of town October 12th, Bracey calling him, telling him to return to Inkster for a problem with the little boy. We're told when Smith returned, he allegedly beat his girlfriend, Bracey, and in the process, also allegedly attacked the little boy, both taking Timmy to the hospital hours later after the beating where Timmy died. The medical examiner says the cause of death was blunt force trauma to the boy's body. Both Smith and Bracey were arrested. No testimony in court today. All this will resume on December 7th. Both parties back in court, and we understand uh, this will be brought up yet again. We are live tonight. Sean Lake, Local 4. 
All right, Sean. Decision 2016, about six days to go now before voters head to the polls in the race for the White House. All about turnout in a few key states. A bad sign for Hillary Clinton is that African-American voters are not early voting in the numbers that Democrats would hope. Steve Handelsman breaks down the numbers for us. Steve. Devin, it's President Obama who got African-Americans out to vote in record numbers twice, and he's out today to try to help his rival from 08. Get that number up now. Hillary Clinton today, she needs a big turnout in the swing states that in Tampa, Joe Biden said would beat Donald Trump. You guys win Florida. It's just done over. There's no path. This was Broward County, Florida today. Enthusiasm for Clinton among African-Americans, but the turnout of black voters is down. In Florida, where four million people have early voted, and black turnout is down even more in swing state North Carolina, compared to the record set when President Obama ran. To be expected, says radio host Roland Martin. She's not that different candidate, and she's not African-American. A huge, young, diverse crowd lined up in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, to see President Obama try to motivate better turnout. We don't win this election, potentially, if we don't win North Carolina. So I hate to put a little pressure on you, but the fate of the republic rests on your shoulders. Back in Florida, young African-Americans showed up to back Trump. I love that sign, blacks for Trump. Trump is demonizing Clinton and Washington lock her up, lock her up. to drive his turnout up and Clinton's down. You can beat the system, the rigged system, and deliver justice. A new GOP ad targets African Americans. We are asking for your vote. Vote Republican. In a contest that could hinge. Both of you for Donald Trump. On whose voters show up. New CNN polls out today showed Trump leading in Arizona and Nevada, Clinton ahead in Pennsylvania and Florida in this close race. From Washington, Steve Handelsman, Local 4. All right, Steve, and we are doing something special on election night for users of the Click on Detroit app. Of course, we will be sending out push alerts for all of the major races, but this year we'll also be sending out push alerts for the local races of most interest to you. You configure it, and then we take care of sending you the updates. You can download the Click on Detroit app for free in your app store. Just search WDIV. A credit union is making a huge splash tonight in Highland Park because they're giving away $10,000 in free gasoline in $20 increments. It's happening at this BP station on Woodward. So let's get right to Paula Tutman, who's live there tonight. And Paula, how's it going? I know at four, it was really busy when we talked to you then. And it's still really, really busy. I'm told that the line still stretches back almost about a mile. So we're at the BP at Woodward, just north of Colorado. And this is being done by One Detroit Credit Union. So they're giving away $20, incre or $20, $20 increment of gasoline. Uh, they've got a credit for about $10,000. So they're going to do about 500 cars or until 7 o'clock, whichever one comes first. And they're only at number 145, 146. So there's plenty to go. Here's the thing. It's a two-hour wait. And how do I not talk to a lady in a Betty Boop car, right? How do I not talk to a lady in a Betty? Okay, so you were telling me you were in line for how long? For about an hour or so. So for about an hour or so. But here's the deal. You came from? Pontiac, Michigan. Okay, and you know it's going to cost you $7 to get back to Pontiac, to get back to the Yak, right? Yes. I do. So this was worth it to you? Yes, it was. All right, there you go. Get your gas. Uh, listen, guys, here's the thing. What One Detroit Credit Union is doing, though, is they're doing face-to-face -face contact because what they want to do is they want to let people know that they can refinance their vehicle at half the interest rate. And that really is a huge saving. So while Betty Boop here might save $20 in gasoline, if she refis her car, she could save Thousands. We're going to put the information on our website, clickondetroit.com, as well as my Facebook page, Local 4 Paula Tupman, so you can refi your ride. Guys, back to you. Okay, Paula. A lot of people don't even realize about that interest rate and how much that's you know, exactly it can right. really yeah. cost you. Rolls over, you bet. It does. All right, uh, in good health, local doctors are seeing more cases of shingles lately and the painful rash it's known for. Uh, experts say a lot of people are confused about exactly what causes shingles, how it's spread. Let's bring in Dr. Frank McGeorge here. No confusion over, I guess, how dreadfully painful this condition is. That is absolutely true, Devin and Kimberly. In fact, here's the most basic thing you need to know. If you've ever had the chicken pox, you are at risk for developing shingles. Now, the rash occurs when the chickenpox virus is reactivated in your body, usually decades after it first made you sick. 
The varicella zoster virus is what causes chicken pox. It remains in your body even after you recover. Once you have chicken pox, the virus lies dormant in uh, your nerves, usually in your spine for an indefinite amount of time and then at some point in your life can reactivate. That reactivation causes the painful rash and blisters known as shingles. But infectious disease expert Dr. Tim Heyman says you may first experience more subtle symptoms. Most people will develop some tingling and burning in what's called a dermatomal area or it's an area that's typically uh, supplied by one nerve and so it's typically a strip of skin. The virus can spread through direct contact with fluid from the rash. It's a risk for people who have never had chicken pox and if they become infected, they would develop chicken pox, not shingles. A shingles vaccine is recommended for people age 60 and up. It can cut your risk in half, and if you've already had shingles, the vaccine may help prevent it from coming back. If you suspect you have shingles, you should get medical treatment quickly. The earlier it's identified, the earlier it can be treated with antivirals and with medicines to try and prevent the actual outbreak and then also prevent some of the long-term side effects. One shingles vaccine on the market, and it's made with a weakened version of the virus. And within the next year, another shingles vaccine will be released, and it's going to be made with a killed virus, which expands the number of people who can get it now. It's fascinating. You and I have talked so much about immune yeah. issues and the way that we've changed them, but most children today mm -hmm. are vaccinated against the chicken pox. Right. Yeah. So we're trying to figure out, I guess, how much that impacts this current problem with shingles, right? Right, and it's kind of interesting. First of all, we don't have the bulk of children that were immunized against chicken pox old enough yet to get shingles, yeah. so we've got to wait on that one. But there is at least a theoretical risk that they could develop shingles, but there's another side twist, and that's because there's less native chicken pox going around because of the, the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Adults are not being exposed to chicken pox, which might boost their immunity against shingles. So there's a few yeah. little other things in play here, and the full picture I think is going to emerge in the next probably five to ten years. Fascinating. I've yeah. had shingles and it's no fun. Oh, tell you it just that. sounds <laughs> dreadful. Yeah, yeah get really the vaccine is. if you yeah. are in the risk group, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, All right we appreciate it. Well, time now for an update to a story that Kimberly first brought us last night at 11. Yeah, right? we told you about William Echoes. His father bought a house from the Detroit Land Bank. They were cleaning the yard and found a mountain of tires buried underneath years of overgrown vegetation. Well, we got involved and so did the city and today Detroit Public Works removed all of those tires. Just imagine that. I mean, you're out there cleaning and he didn't know, you know, he just, you know, bought yeah. the house as is, so. And it was a mountain. It was a tires. mountain of tires. Good heavens. Nice yeah. to see it work out for yeah. him, though. There is new proof tonight. Bill Murray really is about the coolest guy on the planet. <laughs> new tonight. What he did last night at the World Series game for one fan that left her thinking it had to be a dream. <laughs> I'm Sandra Ali. Essential oils are a popular natural remedy to help with sleep, pain, even allergies. But coming up, how they can be dangerous in the wrong doses, especially for children. Coming up tomorrow on Local 4 News Today, it's almost time to put the lawnmower away for the winter, but not so fast. At 5 a.m., we've got the four simple things that you should do right now to keep your mower running in tip-top shape before you store it away for those cold winter months. So wake up with us for that. That's during Thrifty Thursday. And as always, we've got your weather and traffic on the fours when you join us from 4.30 to 7 a.m. We'll see you Thursday morning. Jeopardy has a new at 6. Showing up after hours to shop for jewelry. Police say this burglar was in and out in 15 seconds, but they're hoping you'll recognize about him new at six. Also fighting back against the rising price of EpiPens, the story of two men determined to bring a more affordable option back to the market. That's at six. Well, it is a popular trend to use essential oils as a natural remedy to relieve pain, improve sleep and clear up allergies. They can also be dangerous in the wrong doses, especially for children. Sandra Ali has one doctor's warning. Essential oils are derived from plant parts. Many have a history of medicinal use, but misuse of this popular natural remedy can be harmful, especially to children. Turn around. I'm going to do your, this immunity on your back. Allison White is a mom of three girls. 
Does that help us when we have some sniffles? She believes in the power of essential oils, so much so. This helps her respiratory system. She sells them. Owie, it's a blend for skin support for kids. She believes this popular holistic remedy can do everything from purify your home to refine your skin and enhance wellness. But if used improperly, doctors say essential oils can be deadly. Many of them have been associated with all sorts of toxicity, both acutely, uh, chronically, and sometimes in uh, in interaction with other drugs, and some of the worst manifestations are seizures, uh, dysrhythmias, and death. Look at the numbers from the National Poison Data System released last December. Adverse reactions, while not severe, are on the rise. Pediatric exposures equaled 11,467 reports, the highest number of complaints where an oil was identified. Tea tree, eucalyptus, cinnamon, and clove oil. Dr. Green says he sees an average of two to three kids per month for excessive doses. I always caution parents that there's a lot of potential unknowns. When you buy these essential oils, you don't actually know what you're getting. It's difficult to know what's in them since they're not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, and they're becoming more widely available at organic grocery stores, even Walmart and countless online retailers. So when I'm out and about and I see oils at the dollar store or just on the end cap of a retail store, Sometimes that gives me a uh, pause for concern. White is so motivated to find that answer, she researches all of the oils her family uses. I always like to look at the source of the oils, how they were bottled, how the plants were grown, um, what chemicals, were there any chemicals used on the plants as far as fertilizer goes? White warns the most critical takeaway is to figure out a proper dilution ratio. I say start low and go slow and see what their little sensitivities and their little bodies can handle and what helps them to thrive and be healthy. Oftentimes a little is good and more is toxic. Dr. Green reminds you some of the most potent toxins in the world are natural and they can interact with prescriptions and over-the-counter medications. That's why it's always really important to tell your doctor everything you use for wellness. I'm Sandra Ali, back to you. All right, thanks, Sandra. Well, the Cubs forced a game seven last night, but the win wasn't the most exciting part of the game for one Cubs fan. Karen Michael is right here to the left of Bill Murray. She was wandering around outside Progressive Field shortly before game six of the World Series, kind of hoping she might find a ticket, and that's when she saw Murray, who turned around and gave her a free ticket to the World Series. Little did she know the ticket was in the seat right next to Murray, and the two proceeded to watch the game together. She said, Bill Murray, was as friendly and as funny as you'd imagine.